Welcome to Biohacking Life Hacks, and I've got Philip, uh, and he's written his book called Siddhartha Sets a Goal. So, so Philip, before we start, why a book on on the Buddha, and why is he setting a goal? That's what I want to know. Oh, okay, okay, fantastic! Uh, wonderful questions right off the bat. Wonderful questions right off the bat. You know what? This has been on my mind for, or had been, I should say, before I actually wrote the book. It had been on my mind for years. Like this topic had been on my mind for years. Because I started at some point, I describe it all in the book, but um, I, I was going through a very difficult time. And a friend introduced Eckhart Tolle by means of a recording of a talk by Eckhart. And I began listening, and pretty soon I realized what it was all about. It pretty much it was about being present, observing your thoughts, and kind of d discouraging uh, your mind from producing thoughts. Just think as little as possible, and you know, not uh, non thinking was the solution to bliss. And that worked. That began working for me. That I, I began experiencing. Uh, just less, less, less pain, less, less suffering as, as a result, because you know thoughts and desires produce suffering. We know that from Buddhism. Um, and it, it was really working, but the problem was that I didn't like my life situation. And in order to change your life situation, you need to think. You need to use your your mind. We were talking about Napoleon Hill. We're talking about the secret, the law of attraction. Uh, thoughts are things. Yeah. So if thoughts if thoughts are things, and I'm not allowed to, th to think because thinking takes you away, it takes you out of bliss, then then it seems that I'm stuck. Um. So why? Uh, so th this is why this became uh, this was a conundrum for me that I really needed to solve. I, re I really needed to solve it because I knew uh, I, I had been listening to Osho for for a while as well. Actually, I met you at, a, at an Osho retreat. That's where you and I actually met in New York. Um, I've, so actually, I've, had, actually, I've actually been on five or six Osho retreats. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure you have. I, I've been only. I've, I've you know, it's only natural that you would have. But I, I I've only been to one. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was. It was interesting. It was. It was lovely. Wonderful. But uh, I, I'd been listening to Osho for a, a while, and uh, I, I understood that. It, I, I understood what he was saying, and it, it worked on me. I, I got it on a very, very deep level that there is no goal in life, no purpose. I, it, it would, it would seep through me, and, and it would sink in really uh, deeply. So it was. I was not surprised. I was not really. It was not a. Tremendous revelation from Eckhart Tolle. It's just the way that he presented it was uh, pretty powerful. Uh, it would. He has a very good, interesting style, very modern style, very kind of very very laid back, and um, I, I really loved it. But I wanted to self actualize. I wanted to self actualize. I I, I, I still do. I'm I am in the process of of self actualizing right now. Um, that's why I began, I began my search. I began my search. Is, is that why you studied, um, the Buddha? Because you wanted to self-actualize? I, I studied the Buddha. I did, I, I, okay. I studied the Buddha. I began to study the Buddha at some point, um, a while, a really while ago when I read the Dhammapada. The Dhammapada. Actually, in the beginning, the, the the very first verse of the Dhammapada is the mind. I I, I couldn't I couldn't recite it right now from uh, you know by heart, but uh, it it goes something like the mind is the cause of everything. So the your 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 life follows your mind just like a card, just like a card follows the ox. It's, it's like that. It's, it tells you, like he he tells you, like from the very beginning, that the mind, that your life follows your mind. Well, I became I be, I became fascinated with the Buddha more and more at different stages of my life because uh, even today I I believe that uh, this is probably his teaching is probably the ultimate. It is probably the ultimate teaching because 
looking at what's going on today, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you know, the, the human, human life is, is in a big disarray today. The human consciousness is in a big disarray. The, the people are being pulled apart and, and so on. Um, and Buddha's, Buddha's teaching, I think, is a solution to that because he brings the person into the center. And that's where they, we, we are separated on the surface. And we, but we are one. In the center, we are not, it's not that we are close. We, the, the, the more we go within, the more we become conscious, the more we go within, the more, the closer to each other we become. But when we get to the ultimate point, the ultimate deep inside, the, that the center, the nirvana, I guess, right? That's the center that they, we are no longer close. We are just one. We're just one. We're one consciousness. So that's why, you know, and that's where all the separation ends. There's no, there's no separation. We are just one. We, we just, we, it, it, it's funny that we fight with each other. And it's, it's funny if you think about it. It's like, imagine the ocean and there, there's a wave. There's one wave that appears, right? It kind of appears. And then there's another wave that appears. And then imagine these waves kind of arguing with each other and shouting at each other hey you you this you that and and ocean sitting back thinking with you there there's no you there's no me there's no you you are me you are both me you are ocean shut up and relax <laughs> just 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 do your just relax just unfold and you know just unfold and and uh enjoy being enjoy that that form that you're having right now at the moment but you know this but this is what we're doing as human beings where are these waves we are, a, we are emanations of exactly the same thing. <laughs> We're fighting with each other like as if we are, you know, we, we are basically, we are sleeping. We are sleeping. And the, the whole point of, you know, we, we are unaware that we are ocean, the ocean. And this is the kind of the nature of our sleep. But one so thing so, that... So, so, yes, self, yes. so self-actualization is, is, a, a, is an awakening. Is that what you're saying? Well... There are two kinds of awakening. There are two kinds of awakening. One is spiritual. That's going deep within and uh, dissolving all forms. Just going deep within. That is the purpose. That is the purpose of meditation. But self-actualization is is um, is an <clears throat> is a um, creative enlightenment. It's a different form of it. It's a different enlightenment. It's it's enlightenment. It's enlightenment that allows you that allows the human being to act and to do in this world but to act and to do in such a way the in a self-actualized way in a, uh, in an enlightened way meaning that you are doing what you were meant to do in this life as a human being like what you were born to do it does, does not necessarily mean that you were born to to become this or that in terms of your profession. That that's not because that that's not exactly what I mean. What I mean is each and every one of us is born with certain what I call neuropotential. <clears throat> neuropotential. Now, if we're born with certain neuropotential, um, this means that we are we are going to be good at some things and not at, not as good at other things. Each of us individually. So, so this is this is the gift you're talking about. It's, uh, neuropotential means your your exactly. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's your gift, but it's also it could be your weakness as well. I mean, if you're if, if, when you have a strength, you also have a weakness. That's just it's just uh, you know a strength and a weakness are just two sides of the same point. If you're if you're good at one thing, you're almost necessarily not as good at, at another because you can't be equally brilliant at. 10 things but it's probably not going to happen or leonardo da vinci was was you know good at several things but you know there are few people like that i'm pretty sure i'm not <laughs> but someone like for example uh, like mike tyson do you know the guy was born to be a boxer he was born to box in fact if he uh, he hit you know he's physically gifted he's he's obviously physically gifted but would he make would he have made just as good a baseball player or a, or a basketball or a basketball player per, probably not he, he 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 could have been a pretty good one 
but there's only one Mike Tyson in boxing. See, that's and that's what um, that that's what each of us should uh, aspire to be as a creative as a creative person. Now, something is something that that I realized at some point during my uh, kind of my my research, my my. Uh, my study, my self-study, and so on and so on, because I, I gave this a lot of thought, and, and I, uh, uh, using the practice that I offer in the in, in in the book that I teach in the book, kind of towards the end, and I actually have the the free mini course on on doing that. I have been um, kind of eliciting insights through my uh, subconscious and superconscious minds, right? Just to get to get insights, to understand the nature of reality, the nature of human beings, the my, my own nature, and so on and so on. And and I realized at some point that there's a spectrum, and this is something that's very important. That there's a spectrum um, between being and doing. There's there's, a, there's definitely a spectrum between being and doing, and all of us human beings we are somewhere on this spectrum and we are some of us are more of like um uh, those uh, more more of those who are apt to just be and some of us would rather be active and proactive be agentic in our life yeah, and creative i'll give you an example right Eckhart Tolle is a is a perfect example immediately after his awakening he didn't he didn't do anything for I don't know, two, three years or a couple of years. He just sat on the bench in London, I believe. I believe it was in London that he just sat on the bench and he just did nothing because he was in such a state of bliss. He wasn't, um, he wasn't urged to do anything. He, I mean, sometimes he forgot to eat, to eat. Eventually, and so what that means is he went to the, all the way to the being uh, all the way to the uh, being side of the spectrum. Now, so that's an extreme example. Another extreme example would be someone like Ramana Maharshi, for example. Now, that that's a very interesting example because uh, at a very young age, as a as a teenager, like early teenager, I think it was like fourteen or fifteen, he began to just feel that he didn't belong in the world of uh, human um, just activity. But he belonged in a temple he belonged in an ashram where he could just simply meditate and then do nothing else and he he definitely forgot to eat he forgot to eat he forgot to uh, like wash himself it just it didn't matter he, because he simply was he was just like he would just be there <laughs> like and he and he would and he's he, he's a very intelligent human being as you as you can tell from his teaching you know when he when you um uh, you know, when you immerse yourself in a little bit of his uh, uh, his teaching, right? But that's the that is the being side of the spectrum. Now, on the doing side of the spectrum, and this this is just by nature. This is this we are naturally like that. It's not that it's not that you become like that. We are predisposed by birth to to be like that. Someone on the other side of the spectrum would be some, someone like Tony Robbins. Like Tony Robbins. Can you imagine Tony Robbins sitting in meditation for hours? Mm. No, because he would feel like it's a waste of time. Or, or Elon Musk. Exactly. Yeah. That, that was exact, that, that would yeah. be my next... Uh, yeah, you read my mind. That would be my next um, uh, example. Yeah. All, constantly doing, 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 doing. He, uh, uh, someone like that he simply cannot be happy doing nothing because the mind in the, the mind not only the mind the whole the entire neurophysiology the entire cycle and neurophysiology is active and wants to create wants to do something now i i'm like that i'm more like that i'm not a kind of person to be too accepting of a problem i'd rather solve the problem for example you know if you're sitting there and some people say, "Hey, you can't meditate uh, a tiger like you can. You can't meditate yourself out of a tiger tiger's attack." For example, they say that you know you uh, you know if a tiger is attacking you, that's it's not time to meditate. Okay, that that's that 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 that's yeah, that's pretty obvious. 
that's pretty obvious, but there's a lot more to that. There's just a lot more to that. First of all, you can meditate yourself into better situations that you, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be in a situation where you're being attacked by a tiger anyway and if you if you're doing enough meditation in every day in your life then you have enough uh, you're you're with it enough not to put yourself in that situation in the first place <laughs> so <laughs> so that is one great value of meditation however however if you're sitting let's say for example i'm sitting here and i have a leak on you know in my uh, ceiling and and acid is dripping on my on my hand and it's just a little drop of acid drops on my hand and then it drops again and every minute there's a drop of acid well it's pretty painful and i could just sit there and i could meditate i could i can get into the total state of surrender to this unfortunate reality or i shouldn't say unfortunate it's just reality or i could just move my hand and that's doing so so i could just meditate and surrender and that would be being i could just be with it or i can just move my hand and that's doing i can do something about it so um, so, so we need a bit of both is that what you're saying we need to be so in touch with our uh entire full we need to be so in touch with our full spectrum of consciousness throughout the day all the all the waking hours all the waking hours like a meditative it's a meditative state so that we would we would understand we would know at any point by being um this extreme witness by being super observing and observant we would know exactly what to do and what not to do at any moment in time at any moment in our lives if we have that practice every single day then we have that wisdom you know is that it's like that serenity prayer you know the serenity prayer god grant grant me the uh, the, uh, the, yes. the 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 strength to accept yes. things i cannot change to uh, um to change the things that i can right the the power like the, the strength to change yeah. the things that i can something like that i don't i don't remember exactly and, and, and the wisdom to know which is which yes well that's exactly that's exactly where it's at so some of the things we accept some of the things we change and and if and it changes it can change at any time it can change day by day like today this is a thing that i cannot change but tomorrow i could probably change it tomorrow hmm. you, you talk about because uh, i read that section being and doing uh no mind and mind uh witness and doer and i was also thinking because i study eastern philosophies um the being would be the masculine and the doing would be the feminine uh the silence you had the silence and the creative so the silence would be the masculine and the creative would be the feminine do you know so we we've now come to that duality you know, hot, cold, fem, masculine, feminine. Uh, so, mm -hmm. how how do you see uh, the masculine and the feminine? What does that mean to you? Do you know, like in, in terms of this being and doing, like how does it? And because you also talked about no mind and mind, so 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 how does that tie in? Do you know, with because they're opposites, aren't they? Well. Um, I mean, the masculine. It, it's interesting. I, I'm not a hundred percent sure that the masculine and the feminine are opposites of each other. But, they but, they are yeah, that's right. They're not opposites. But, um, but they are but they are but they are complementary energies that are different yeah. from one another. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's 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 yeah, and they and they do and they do have oppositions. No question. But, about but, but so does being and doing is being and doing opposite of each other then? But what yes, you see when when you when you read creative you think in feminine because uh, because because of the creative um kind of a, let's say i'm a creative person i'm not a you know i'm not a scientific scientifically mind person i'm a minded person i'm a creative person let's say that's not that's not exactly what i uh, i had in mind that's not that's not, not exactly what i meant okay. what, creative in um in my book when i when i'm talking about it i mean i i mean the propensity to create to 
uh, not necessarily to be artistic, but to be, but to be agentic rather, like to have this propensity to, uh, to act proactively, to act, to do things proactively, so as to shape reality. So I would actually make that more masculine. I would be, I would be, I would say that being is probably a little bit more feminine. And doing and doing and cre creative agentic part is more masculine, probably just because it's more more active. Because the way so I study Eastern philosophies, right. and the way they right. in there describe um, the masculine, and the feminine. So, for example, if for this room, this room is the masculine. The, this space is the masculine, and everything inside this room is the feminine. Right. Um, so, in terms of if there was a storm. Uh, the storm, the tornado, that's the mass. That's the feminine, but the eye of the storm, that that thing that doesn't move, it's completely still, is the masculine. Yeah. So the mass. So in this, so the universe is basically feminine, right? Yeah. The tower. So, the tower is, yeah. is is feminine, so, right? So, so the entire universe is feminine, but the space, yes. but the space that the universe is in is yes. the masculine. Uh, I, I agree with you. Yes, it, it's a it's a very it's a very good way to to think about it. There there are, there are many ways, of course, to to think about the masculine and the feminine. Now, one of them one of them that is practical and it's um it it's it's accurate as well. Like metaphorically speaking, that a man is the form. The form is the, the man is the boundary. The man is the form. Or, or the vessel, which is the same thing. The space, yeah. The, this, the, it is, it is the, it is the boundary that allows for a shape to form. That allows for what, for whatever the content is, to the, or or the contents are to be shaped into that. So the the masculine is the the masculine is the, um, let's say, is the vessel. Let's say, um. You know, a, a like a tankard or a or a or, or a bottle, right? Or a lamp, or whatever it may be. And the water or the oil in it is the feminine. Yeah, yeah. Now, that the, and the way that and you said, like the eye, and the the way you put it, the eye of the storm, kind of that is the masculine, and the storm itself is is the feminine. That's also very good, but. I think it's a it's a deeper it's a it would require some deeper thought to get into that, but that's I think it's a very interesting. Um, so 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 how do you how do you describe because you talk about no mind and mind, so is no mind no, not thinking, no thoughts? Well, yeah, by definition, yeah, yeah no, yeah, no mind by definition because the mind is the one that identifies with, the one that produces thoughts and identifies with thoughts. So by definition, it's uh, the the Buddha field. Is a field of no thought, no mind. Okay, all no, right. No thought, no mind. No thought, no mind. Because uh, you know, I, like everybody likes to take cannabis, right? You, you smoke some cannabis and you feel oh, great. And I, yeah, but but you know, I was thinking, but why, right? Why why do people? And you know, it took me a while, but it's because when I take do cannabis, um, it's it's the same feeling I get when I do um, vipassana. You know, the Vipassana meditation, um, because it expands. So what I noticed with the cannabis is that it, it naturally expands my consciousness. So it naturally puts me in a meditative state because, you know, you're like naturally meditating okay. um, because it shuts down your thoughts, expands your consciousness. Wow. And, you, and, you know, like, and, and so that's how I, and when I do deep meditation, it does exactly the same thing happens, you know, like Vipassana, for example. So. Mm -hmm. Met, so cannabis is basically um, allows just allows you to meditate constantly, you know, easily. Whereas normally meditation is quite hard to do because your mind is jumping around, going yeah. yang, 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 yang. But with it, but when you take cannabis, it, that all that stops, and you're so while you're in cannabis, you're basically meditating, and which is why it feels so good. Well, you obviously have a different experience of cannabis than I do. Uh, oh, right. if I take, yeah, if I take cannabis, forget about it. I am I am immersed in deep thought. Oh, right. It, it, it becomes all about thinking. I, I cannot stop thinking. It's all about thinking and bringing up uh, bringing up memories and and 
and going deeper and deeper. It's like thinking and thinking about thinking. And it's, it's, it's completely all about thinking for me when, when it comes to cannabis. There's different strains of cannabis um, that do different things. But yeah. But yeah, it wouldn't okay. matter. For me, it wouldn't matter. I, I never, uh, actually, I should say at a really higher dose, uh, I, sh I should say that I, um, I've done, I've, I've smoked cannabis uh, when I was in, in New York for, for a while. It kind of like, it, it was like a medicine to cope with, uh, <laughs> to, right. cope with it, to cope with living in New York. Yeah. Um, about like, you know, like a joint a week, or something like that. But sometimes, because I'm not a avid uh, user of, of cannabis, I would, you know, I would smoke a little bit and then the dose would be just a little bit overwhelming. It would be a little bit much. It will be, and at, at those higher, higher, really high doses, that state would, would kick arrive. In. I would actually uh, kick in. Yes, that that state would sometimes kick in. I ex I did experience um, that that state of no mind. It, it's like brief satori. I I have experienced brief satori moments under the influence of cannabis. Yes, I, I have done that. Hey, you've done vipassana, right? I have not done vipassana. No. Oh, okay. So the vipassana is basically uh, it's the Buddhist meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree. Uh, and he wouldn't get up until he reached enlightenment. He was actually doing a vipassana meditation, mm. and so that's where that meditation comes from. So he described that meditation, and so vipassana basically is to get you to do the Buddha's uh, enlightenment meditation, that last meditation he does, and that meditation requires you to let go of everything. Yeah, and so in vipassana. It's several stages, but the first stage is getting you to learn to focus, this, this. But then the last stage is basically to, um, like, there's no mantra, there's nothing, you know, like, there's nothing to attach onto. Because in Vipassana, if you attach onto anything to help you meditate, then at yes. some point you have to let go of that thing that is yep. helping you meditate to go to the, to, the, to the higher levels. And then it's really hard to let go. So in Vipassana, they teach you to uh to not be attached to anything no mantra no no you know watching the breath nothing it's just pure um empty mind you know and yeah when you get to day six or seven of the pasna it's like taking a psychedelic it's like taking lsd um, it has that kind of effect on the brain because it sort of <coughs> explodes that um but anyway so you, you you talked about in your thing you were talking about decluttering the mind right well you know before we even uh before we even um get to that yeah it, i was given an example of of an exercise yeah. of how to use the mind to actually clean out your thoughts and to have less thinking because a lot of our thinking is um is a result of unresolved issues un unresolved something even even okay even the most trivial thing even the most trivial thing you need to send out a letter or a parcel you need to go to the post office and send out a parcel right to ship to ship a parcel but you keep forgetting about it right? you keep you keep procrastinating on it you keep procrastinating and because you have other things to do well for as long as it sits on, under your bed or in the, your kitchen, that parcel that needs to be shipped out, it's going to be like a splinter in your mind. It's going to be like, like Morpheus called it. It's like a splinter in your mind. It never lets go. It's constantly there. It's constantly there, whether you like it or not. If, even if you're busy with something, it's still somewhere in the recess of, of your mind that, that that thing needs to get done. It just needs to get done, damn it. And so what do you do with it? You, well, you take action. You take it. You go to the post office and you ship it, and it's gone, and it's, it's just gone. So you don't have to meditate that 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 splinter. You don't have to meditate that splinter away. You need to take action, and it's gone. And how do you take action? Well, any action is preceded by thought. So by so by thinking in a structured way, by having a discipline, having a a, a an inner work discipline, daily inner work discipline, 
you and using certain exercises you can clean up your mind gradually from this and from that and from that and the, these these little things that are in the back of your mind that are constantly nagging they just one by one they just evaporate now <clears throat> something that that's very interesting that you um that you mentioned that it was we passed on a meditation uh when the when siddhartha he was not the buddha yet right he became the buddha at the final moment when he touched the earth and you know the enlightenment happened that was it the mara lost control over because that we, we're in the control of mara right as this representation of you know i don't mean it it's a you know it's a real uh you know eastern devil right no it's just the representation of of all this um uh this, this, this architect this metaphorical architect right who is constantly creating thoughts and creating illusions in and and presents presents them to us look 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 at this look at this and 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 we're supposed to believe it and you know the the deeper our sleep the more we believe it we believe all the forms that they are that they are real that they are permanent we believe in their permanence we we attach themselves to the permanence of every form and so on and so on but here's something very interesting in my study of the life of the buddha i came to a stunning revelation at least it was stunning for me and the re revelation was that um meditation was only it was only a part and maybe not even the the biggest part of siddhartha's journey to buddhahood it was actually the the his main instrument throughout this journey was his mind he was using his mind constantly not maybe not constantly it would maybe while doing while sitting in meditation because every day he would you know he would engage in certain uh, activities you know he would meditate he would you know eat a little bit and then and then he would also think he would sit down and think and this thinking part is for some reason it is virtually or or completely absent i shouldn't say completely because some of the some teachers uh use that method for example uh jake krishnamurti he used this questioning method it was a very much a thinking method so it was similar to that <clears throat> but you see siddhartha thought a lot and this is why the subtitle of my book is how to think yourself into enlightenment now it sounds like a contradiction it sounds like a contradiction but it's not it's it's actually real it's real because siddhartha thought I, and he, and he thought a lot and he and he had to set a goal didn't he right because oh yes and we yeah we're going to get to that absolutely well his his decision to become enlightened to to have this desire to become enlightened he acquired a desire to become enlightened that was a desire and he set it as a goal it was like okay here here's what i want i want to become enlightened so that i could bring this wisdom to others and teach other and help other people as well to relieve them from suffering essentially in a nutshell that that's that in a nutshell that's what it is but that that was a goal okay that was clearly a goal that's a goal why is that a goal because i because i'm at point a and i want to get to point b it's a goal by definition it's just a goal by definition no matter how you slice it if i'm here and i'm not happy being here i want to be there there is my goal and that's it so so that that was clear that was a goal he set a goal now ironically it's just the nature of this this exact goal is the only goal of its kind where you achieve it only when you realize that there are no goals and that's that's the that's the only goal in in human in human endeavors in human consciousness that you know people you know the human being becomes enlightened when he lets go of the final goal because the goal is meaningless and once once that happens boom enlightenment happens but here's something very interesting um 
if you're familiar with the Buddha's life, life of the Buddha, he encountered several distressing sights as a young man. One of them was the sight of an old man. He, he asked yeah. his, he, I, he, it was his cousin, I believe. He asked him, what's that? Why does, what is that man? Why does that man look like that? Well, master, he's old. That, that's, that's what happened to me. That, that you know, time takes a stolen. That, that's what happens to us. And he said, oh, that happens even to princes. Yes, even to princes. Wow. So that's going to happen to me. Shit. That, I, I don't like that. I, I don't want that. That that was extremely distressing because he was look he was living an, an incredibly lavish life, surrounded by beautiful women, the most incredible food and everything. You know, like he was eating, eating Indian food. I always, I always say, I always say to when I when I go to an Indian restaurant, I I always say, uh, look, let me tell you something. Um, <clears throat> I know why Indian people become enlightened because they eat Indian food. <laughs> yeah i mean it's, sometimes sometimes it's so that the experience of eating uh, an indian dish is is so incredible that you just like you become speechless and thoughtless and it's like it's a very meditative state so here's the thing um then he encountered another thing he encountered a sick man and then he encountered a dead a dead man and each of those things, it was so distressing, those three uh, distressing encounters. Now, and, and finally, the, the, a fourth encounter that gave him a clue, a fourth encounter was a monk. So he met a monk and he asked, who is that? Oh, that's a monk. What is he doing? Well, what is, what is a monk? Well, he is seeking enlightenment. He's seeking, uh, f uh, you know, ultimate freedom from suffering. He wants to become enlightened. So Siddhartha was, oh, wow, oh, look at that. Wow, interesting. So he saw the suffering, and he saw, and intuitively he saw it, a way out. There was a way out. And that, that, consumed, you see, that consumed him completely. At, at that point, it, 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 nothing else existed for him. Yeah, of course, yeah, he got married, and he was in love, and, but he was already obsessed with the idea. He was already obsessed. He, it, it's clear that, what that's it it was his uh destiny was sealed he was gonna leave the leave the palace and go now now those are three dis distressing encounters but here here's how he dealt with them very interesting i'm, I'm just gonna go i'm just gonna pull up the pdf of that um of that book it's uh the book is uh just give me one second. It's the Life of the Buddha by, by uh, Hiku Nanamoli. It's a very good text, very close to the Theravada tradition. So it's very close to Buddhist tradition. Now, and and I will I will just read from it, right? Just for just for a second, just a, just a little passage. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Let me see. Now, let me see what is going on. Wait a second, wait a second. Uh-huh, yes. So he here we are. Whilst I had such power and good fortune, yet I thought when an untaught ordinary wait a second, wait a second. I don't I don't I just want to get to the gist of it. Okay, so here's what here's what he says. Yet I thought, I thought, right? Keyword, I thought thinking when an untaught ordinary man who is subject to aging right so he's worried about aging not safe from aging sees another who is aged he is shocked humiliated and disgusted now he's talking about himself right he's talking about himself that's what happened to him for he forgets that he himself is no exception now look at his reasoning but i too am subject to aging not safe from aging and so it cannot befit me to be shocked, humiliated, and disgusted on seeing another who is aged. When I considered this, the vanity of youth entirely left me. When you fully realize that, yeah. It was not through sitting in meditation that, uh, in deep meditation, and, and trying to not think about it that did the trick. No. 
it was a very crisp, clear thought. He, hey, he, contempla he contemplated. He yeah. contemplated it. He contemplated it. And that's how he got rid of it. And so that was the old age. And it's extremely methodical. It's methodical. I now I understand that this is a this is a book that was written, you know, a long, long, uh, you know, ages after you know uh, the Buddha was gone. I understand that, but this is true to the tradition, and and um, uh, basically, it's based on the words of the Buddha, the way uh, you know they the way they're presented in Buddhism. And it's it's consistent with it, it's cons completely consistent with with his mind because he was an extraordinarily intelligent human being and he, he was sharp he was so sharp he was so sharp look look at his look look at the next next passage right so this this one was about age then the next passage passage this is actually on page nine and this is this book is actually available uh, online for free it's from. I'll tell you later what the what the um, you can actually just look it up. Piku Nanamoli, the life of the Buddha, and you can just look, they they give they give away this PDF um, uh, for free. So now, here's what it says, page nine. I thought here's the next one. I thought again, keyword thought. When an untaught ordinary man, see how he's methodical. He's he's like okay, look. This has worked for me in terms of aging. This I, I thought this way about aging, and it's just resolved it for me. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply exactly the same method to the next thing. And it's exactly what he does. Exactly what he does. I thought when an untaught ordinary man who is subject to sickness, not safe, not safe from sickness. See, he's talking about sickness now. He, before he was talking about aging, when an untaught ordinary man not safe from aging, now he's talking about not safe from sickness, sees another who is sick, he is shocked, humiliated, and disgusted, for he forgets that he himself is no exception. Now, the reasoning. But I too am subject to sickness, not safe from sickness, and so it cannot befit me to be shocked, humiliated, and disgusted on seeing another who is sick. When I consider this, the vanity of health entirely left me. So first, the, the vanity of youth left him, and the vanity of health left him. So he's no longer attached. So the attachment to health left him because he simply understood it. It is simply senseless to uh, to grab onto something that you know will go away. You just know it. So it just makes no sense intellectually. End of story. <laughs> and if you understand that, once you come to a deep, logical, intellectual realization of that, with a crystal clear mind, boom, it's out. Now, and finally, finally, the final one, I thought, when an untaught ordinary man, untaught ordinary man, who is subject to death, this is the final one, the third one, the death, not safe from death, sees another who is dead, he is shocked humiliated and disgusted for he forgets that he himself is no exception but i but i too am subject to death not safe from death and so it cannot befit me to be shocked humiliated and disgusted on seeing another who is dead when i consider this the vanity of life entirely left me that he overcome the he overcame the fear of death by sitting down in contemplation just thinking about it, yeah. Thinking about it. Thinking would, about it. He, he could have thought about this for weeks, months, you know. Oh, of course. So, this is obvious. Yeah. This is obviously, yeah. This is obviously condensed. This is a condensed, uh, you know, representation. Who knows how long it took him to come to that realization? Maybe he had to do that exercise uh, for a year or two. Mm. Yeah, until yeah, it, yeah. Uh, you know, until eventually it, it just dawned on him. It's like, oh, you know what? It just doesn't make sense to worry about it anymore. It just doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. You see? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I see that. And it's something that you would need to sit there and contemplate. Um, th th there's, a, there's an exercise I've, I used to do many, many years ago. Well, not that many. Um, and you contemplate, uh, what am I? What is it? Um, who am I? Uh, 
who who is another you know something like that and there's there's like three or four questions um what, what is another and things like that and so you you try to contemplate that and then the idea is that if you contemplate long enough right. could be a week could be months whatever years it'll eventually the penny will eventually drop and then that that barrier disappears because suddenly you understand it. Um, of course. So yeah, so you can, but you, you know, in your book, you, you did uh, where you declutter the mind, right? Yeah. Uh, mind I, I I actually did that exercise. Uh, I wrote down things um, that I wish I'd, um, I'd done. Uh, and it's a long list, isn't it? <laughs> yes, so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. I, I wrote loads of things down, but once I written them down, I said, why do I do them? You know, there's nothing to stop me doing them. I can just do these things, you know, so I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to do them now. But um, what, you, you, you talk about dethroning the mind, right? Uh, yeah, well, let me just come back for a second to yeah, the okay. thing. Yeah, you, you, can, you can complete some of these things. Yes, there, there's a, there's, it's a list of things that are on your mind. You're thinking about it. You're thinking about doing it or it, ha it, it either really has to be done or you believe it has to be done or it's something that you really want done or something you started and you never finished so so all all those things now you can you can decide on something you just make a simple decision okay these things i really want to do and i'm going to do them and you can you can just plan them out uh some of the other things you can say you know what forget about it it's not going to do that I, I I cancel this one. That's it. I'm just not going to do it. I was thinking about it. I'm going to reach out to this guy and, and we're going to do something. You know, forget about it. I'm not going to reach out to this guy. That's it. I don't have time for it. I, you know, I, I just, you know, because there's, you know, there's limited resources for, for everything. You cannot necessarily do every single thing that you want to do. Sometimes you just need to, hey, you know what? Cancel that. I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But you um, were saying... <laughs> about so so you you were talking about dethroning the mind so as in taking the mind off the throne as and then uh, and taking and turning it into your say, slave or your master right uh it become it should become your servant right? yes yeah, uh, yeah 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 so, so tell me a bit more about that so how do i how does one dethrone the mind okay well first of all uh we, we need to understand that in the beginning the mind is uh, is the master for most of us. For most of us, now sometimes a child is is born. Like for example, someone like Osho, he was obviously extremely precocious. You know, from from really really early childhood, he could he could see from through right through the BS of all the adults around him. But this is not the case for for most of us. You know, my own example. I, I sometimes yes I could I could see I could see as as a young child I could see that something just didn't make sense but then something clicked in me I would say you know what because they're adults it kind of maybe makes sense that they know what they're talking about although of course when we become adults we understand that that's not the case <laughs> you know <laughs> you know but we are born into a world where initially. As infants, we are essentially, we're at the mercy of everyone else. We don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. We are told what to eat, what to drink, what to think, and so on and so on. Like we, and we just have to absorb it. We, we have no choice because we don't, we don't have a boundary yet. We don't have a boundary. We don't have a choice. If, if, if you're an infant and your mother wants to give you water, you're going to drink the water. What, what are you going to do? How you know you you can't ask for something else. The only thing you can do is cry. But if the only thing you're getting is water, you're going to going to drink the water. If she gives you milk, you're going to drink the milk. If you're going to drink the you know she gives you formula. If she gives you if she gives you vodka, you're going to drink vodka. You don't have a choice. Yeah. But as you are, obviously as you grow older, your boundary begins to shape and so on and so on. But the problem is that so many things are. We, we we become enveloped in mind constructs that have been imposed on us and now and we become and 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 the and the mind and because it seems it's it's such a it's it is such a strong impression it is such a strong feeling this is such a strong mindset that 
you that you have to do these things like you have to be like this or you have to be like that and that the world is like the is structure like that it's, it's it, the, that structure that surrounds you that structure that's in in your mind it is so strong it is so strong it, it compels you to to do things that are really not in your best interest very often and sometimes you know most of the time perhaps now <clears throat> now the mind in that so what happens is the mind is the master so so the mind the mind is the master a priori it, it is the it is the master as we are born and grow up grow into adulthood and for unfortunately for for most of us for most human beings it remains the master it remains the master and it has been the master throughout the human evolution because what what makes what um, what tells us apart from other animals is is the mind because because what it enables what, what it allows us to do is to process the past and to is to pro to process the past to take the past into account so as to make some kind of meaning from it and to and to project into the future and to think up like imagine a future uh, other animals don't really do that they 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 may do it in a very crude way for example you know it gets cold so the birds lift up and they just you know they they go, they fly south they fly south but that's pretty much the extent you know they animals don't plan their lives they don't plan to go to college and then to get a job and so on and so on human beings do that yeah, okay apart from, apart from a squirrel a squirrel will uh, take nuts and bury them to use in winter oh there we go but the, the only problem is she can never find them <laughs> <laughs> well, at least somebody right, you're, right. All, yeah. you're right you, you know yeah. you, you, like we, we we should give more credit to other animals as well we should give more like elephants uh you know the elephants uh brew alcohol they they ferment they, they yeah yeah they 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 gather fruit they they dig, dig up a, like a little uh, little hole in ground in the ground uh they they put some fruit there and they and that's it and they just let it sit for a few, for a few days they don't touch it and they just guard it make sure that nobody touches it and then you know it it it, it, it becomes fermented it ferments and then they come back and they and they consume it and this way they they get intoxicated wow yeah it's crazy <laughs> yeah that's so, so because humans have done that for a very very long time you know taken probably, uh, probably not as long as elephants yeah yeah maybe not as long, <laughs> but you know like um like for us achieving that state of no mind it, it's bliss you know it's just yeah but the, here's the thing we're we're not even talking about the no mind yet yeah the no mind is a state of bliss but what if your what if your life situ situation let's say kind of sucks what if you were what if because your mind has been your master you you are now you are in a profession that is completely wrong for you you live in a city or town or country that is not right for you what if uh you you sometimes you find yourself that you're surrounded by people who are they they, they really they really don't belong in your life they, they really don't belong in your life. sometimes they they uh, maybe they don't care about you or they do certain things that you shouldn't be emulating it is it, just it, it's it's a feeling that you're living someone else's life it, it happens it happens to people i it never really happened to me in in such a profound way i always felt that i always felt that okay i'm not supposed to be doing that but <laughs> but but i'm not supposed to be at this job so and it, it, i would do it for some time i never really held a job for for very long I was always looking and seeking for for something else. I just couldn't. I just couldn't settle. <clears throat> I couldn't settle on a certain career and so on. And so I, I pretty much at some point I gave up. I, I, I realized that I, I'm unemployable. And my own way um, of of making a living that would be more suitable for my uh, for my talents, for my gift, right? For my gift, like we like we talked about before, but subduing but to subdue the mind you subdue to 
to sub well, okay the, the whole process of subduing subduing the mind what happens as a result of it is that the mind instead of becoming being your master now becomes your servant because now you act as the witness now you tell your mind you program your mind instead of instead of running the old imposed upon programming you begin to program it yourself proactively so there's, there's that old saying um the mind is a terrible master but an excellent servant uh, exactly that, that's perfect that's so perfectly said you know well how do you do it to answer your question how do you do that i um i use a practice that i describe in my book and that i um i also i link in my book to the to the free course when i do it but it this this practice it kind of came it came to me as a result of oh, as a result of coming to this practice uh somehow I, I was like practicing it before i realized i was practicing it and then I, I was like okay you know what this is what exactly what i'm doing and that's the the aim wheel practice yeah so so i was looking at the aim wheel <clears throat> which is awareness insight and manifestation so i i went through that course and so the mm -hmm. for the first 10 minutes is you meditate you sit in awareness yep and then sorry let me get this right so and then five minutes is you focus on the idea or the thought you contemplate it and then the last five minutes you visualize the desired outcome is that right have i got it yeah. right? no yes this is this is an, yeah this is an example of um of how you would structure your daily practice now there are there are three <clears throat> there are three segments to the practice that i do every day i've done it every day every day since 2015 uh so for about what eight years now coming on nine years and uh i did i, I have skipped maybe one or two days every now and then but the, the longest streak <clears throat> the longest uh, streak i've ever had was like uh, about three years a little bit over three years and right now i'm at about a little bit over two years so without skipping a single day because that's it's it's so important it's so important to have that daily to do it daily to have a daily practice now there are three segments um the, the three segments actually belong to two realms one is no mind which is the meditation part and the other two segments are you working with the mind so there are three segments one is one of them is no mind and two of the others working with the mind and you simply uh okay the three the three segments are the first one is meditation what is that insight and surrender uh not not insight that that's um that's just surrender you simply surrender to the present moment there is no need for thought there's no need for anything you simply accept reality just the way it is and you witness it you just you simply cultivate the witness that is always the first step in any situation that is the first step no matter where you find yourself that is the first step the beauty of this practice that i'm that i teach is that i call it enter the stream okay you have a problem someone comes to me with a problem and says okay th th this is what's going on in my life this is what's happening in my life right now okay so what is the solution okay step one enter the stream just enter enter the stream are you obviously in a situation where you need to be doing something but you also are obviously in a situation where you need to be accepting something as well there's no question about it if you have if you're facing a problem something that you should be accepting and the shot is something you should be changing <laughs> this, you, you, you know the, you, that, that's it it pretty much goes without saying that's something there is a saying for every problem under the sun there is a solution or there is not if there is one go and find it if there isn't never mind it but but if a person comes to you that's but you're a coach right you're a coach and some someone comes to you and says hey you know joe i have this health issue okay if they if if a, if a if if a potential client or or a friend comes to you with a health issue well it 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 it, it almost necessarily i shouldn't even say almost it necessarily means that they should probably be doing something about it yeah they that's probably yeah. they probably should do something about it and they should be doing something now they, they yeah, that, shouldn't go to the doctor and lie down and get surgery they probably should do something because the, the thing is the thing with our society is we're taught 
that it's always somebody else's fault or problem. You know, like yeah, or if someone else can can solve it for you. Yeah, and that's if you're, if, yeah. Right. If you're a doctor, if you're if you're ill, then you think, oh, it's the doctor's problem. But it is exactly. your problem, exactly. you know? and, and that's where we go wrong. We think it's the doctor's problem, but it's actually your own problem. You know. Yeah, you know, I, as um, as a doctor that helped me heal my knee without surgery, he has a he has this little parable. He says, uh, "Well, a patient uh, called me and said, uh, well, doctor, what what do I need to, uh, what what, what I, like I have a problem. So what should I do about this problem? I don't remember what exactly the problem was, and um, he says, well." you need to be working on this this and that and this is what you should do in, in you need like a comprehensive solution right there she says oh but yeah but only only my kidney i only have a kidney problem it's it's just it's just my kidney and he says okay no problem then just send just uh, send your kidney to me I'll, I'll work on it i'll send i'll ship it back to you if you think that your it's it's just your kidney that you should be able to remove it and just you know just send, send it to me and know yeah send it in no no, no problem so <laughs> so enter the stream enter the stream number one step one segment one meditation why because in any situation if something distressing you something is worrying you something is distressing you have a problem you need to just relax calm down chill that, that one of the benefits of meditation is but before you even before you even subverting before you even turn your mind from a master into a servant which is a process that takes takes place over time it may take place in an instant but the the the, the you know the work on it the preparation usually it takes some time to realize oh my god wow my mind has been really you know in charge of me and so on and so on yeah it takes it's a process but right now you you may just need to just relax a little bit and just surrender to the situation. The, the, always step one. Okay, I'm witnessing this right now. Even a person who's let's say a person is getting robbed on the street. Give me all your money, your money on your like your your wallet or your life. At that moment, you need to be extremely calm because otherwise you're going to do something stupid. Hmm. You're you're much better off just just remaining calm. Your 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 much your your chances of getting shot are a lot less if you're if you're a meditator. If if you if you meditate, your chances of getting shot are, are a lot less because you'll simply be calm and you'll you'll just you will just go with the flow. You will go with the situation. You will comply with the situation in such a way that uh, there's no point of shooting you. <laughs> it's just just it's just it's just completely needless, unless you're Bruce Lee, and then it's a completely different story. You know, then you know what to do. But for most of us, it might, me personally, I probably wouldn't argue with a gun, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, step one, segment one, is meditation. Meditation, at least for five minutes. You can start with five minutes. You, you don't have to even do ten. Just start with five, no problem. Five five minutes is a meditation. You can do that. If if you just focus on your breathing for, for five minutes, great. Now, so that's segment one. So now that you've done that segment, now that you've relaxed and you're breathing more evenly, you're more calm, your mind has settled a little bit. Okay, you have primed yourself for the next segment. And the next segment is receiving insights. Now, now you're working with the mind. Okay, now, only in the first segment, you're in the Buddha field. In the next segment, you're now working with, with the mind. You should probably go this way, right? So Because it, it whirls this way. All right, so you you just did your meditation. You go to the next segment, which is now receiving insights proactively. And contemplation is just one of the exercises. I, I learned it from John Kiho. I took his course. John Kiho, wonderful, wonderful teacher of um, of uh, kind of manifesting and working with the mind power. So contemplation, very simple exercise. It's just thinking about something in a focused way. You pick something, whatever it may be, you know, it could be this, could be this cup. I'm going to be thinking about this cup and nothing else. But you think about that thing to the exclusion of everything else. You focus on it for five minutes and you use a timer. I always use a timer when I, <clears throat> every day when I sit down, I, I use the Calm app. <laughs> so you were, you done the awareness, the five minute awareness. Oh, that's right. That's right. You do the five minute awareness, which is the yep. meditation part. 
and you proceed to the inside part. Now, why is it? We need to make that distinction. When you're working with the mind, there are two things that you should be doing. You should be receiving insights because you need answers. You don't always know. You, you don't always know everything. And you need answers. You need brilliant information. You need those brilliant, what I call brilliant insights, right? And you need to, well, put out, manifest. Mm -hmm. So uh, manifesting, manifesting some kind of an outcome. And I use the word manifesting because, uh, because you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a very good, very, very valid and very well descriptive word as well it doesn't belong only in the in the book the secret or whatever no it's just you know we manifest outcomes you know all all the time oh but what are you doing in the second part you know oh Sorry. yes it's, you're right you're right I, I i digressed i digressed into the into the into the manifesting part because that's the third part but in the second part like i said there are, there are, there are two things that we're doing with the mind insight and then man, manifesting but but the insight part is is extremely important because we need to in order to set a proper goal, we need to understand what, what the goal is. Very often, we don't know. Very often, we, a person doesn't know. Even Tony Roman says that in his the, the personal power program. I, I, you know, I, would, I would set a goal if I only knew what I wanted, but I don't know. I don't know what I want. Well, that's exactly, that's exactly the part where you find out what you want. So, so what are you doing in insight to find out what you want? Well, contemplation is one of the exercises. Uh, there, there are, you, you can't, you just contemplate a thought. For example, um, you're trying to, you're trying to understand what should be your next career move and you sit down and think, so you sit down, you, you close your eyes and you sit and sit in contemplation and you don't have to even, you, you could contemplate with your eyes open as well, but I, I do it uh, both ways. Well, you sit down and you think about it and you, and you think. Okay, what if I you just kind of imagine almost a situation because it's almost a visualization as well, depending on how you're doing it. Sometimes I do my my entire uh my entire um aim wheel practice while walking. I could be walking, for example, here in the Philippines right now, where I am right now, I could be walking in a mall and just just walking and doing the whole thing while walking. But I'm thinking I'm I'm doing that specific exercise on, on that specific thought. I pick a thought. For example, I. What, what what should be my next business move? And I'm thinking about that. It could be this. It could be that. It could be this. You see, just by allowing, just by um, kind of allotting five minutes to that exact question that you're asking yourself. You're gonna receive insights just by the virtue of just uh, just allowing that time to process that thought. Because most of the time we run around and we never sit down to to focus on something. It's, you know, we we keep running, we keep running the same thoughts over and over in our in our minds and in our heads. And sometimes we we receive insights, but then they get lost somewhere in the shuffle, and then they keep coming back. And then it's just a very chaotic way. To solve a problem or to receive an insight, no, we should we should receive we should uh, elicit our insights proactively from and through our second mind. I call it kind of like our ethereal mind. It is you. It is the mind that extends out of. It is the mind that kind of that is beyond our everyday conscious mind. The everyday thinking mind. We also have the subconscious mind, and we also have the superconscious mind. Now, the subconscious mind is the mind that contains all the information and experiences that we've ever had, but the it also it also contains beliefs and thought structures and our entire like life life paradigm. But the superconscious mind is our conduit to infinite intelligence. Now, I I I personally I believe that there's this um th there's a way for us to tune in to information outside of us outside our just our conscious and subconscious subconscious mind this 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 is how i received an insight for example that i received an insight that i can heal my knee 
without surgery. I didn't, I didn't have a definite frame of reference for that. I had no idea that that was possible. But once I, I received that insight, I received that information. It happened to me back before I even, what, before I was even doing this, before I even meditated, before I even had a meditation practice. But I was younger and it, it happened to me spontaneously. So I know that we can receive insights from beyond ourselves through the ether, through, uh, through, through another human being's mind or through the infinite intelligence, mm. which is this universal mind. I totally, I totally believe that you can do that because it happened to me and it happened to me more than once. So uh, this is why I teach it because I practice it. So just by contemplating something, just by contemplating something for um, for five minutes and focusing on that, you're giving yourself space for that exact thought. And now you're thinking about something in a structured way. And now you're opening up, you're opening a conduit to receive insights that otherwise you wouldn't receive because otherwise you're all, all the time, you're just scattered. Now, there are other exercises. Uh, John Quixote teaches a wonderful exercise where you, um, you say to yourself, uh, like, I already know my next business move. I already know my next business move. I already know my next business move. And then you just, and then you just sit. Okay. And then you just sit and wait for the, wait for the answer. And I believe you also do like a little contemplate contemplation exercise in there as well, but there, there, there are many ways to do it. There's, there's so many ways to do it. I've, uh, I've other, I've created my own exercises on, on how to do it. But you, my point is that you do it proactively. You do it proactively. Okay. You're doing rather than being. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you ask a question. Okay. You really want to know something. So you ask yourself that question and then you massage it in your mind. You, and you, there are many, again, there are many ways. Even you can even use visualization, for example. Visualization is a manifesting exercise. It's an exercise where you work on creating something. But you can use you can use visualization as a as an insight exercise as well because you can imagine yourself in a certain situation and see what it feels like in your mind's eye before you end up in that situation and, and you can you can try out different situations and and see which one feels better to you and which one looks better to you and now all of a sudden you have an insight like you know what actually of, of these five pictures i like this one if you don't do it in a structured way you're just not going to receive that insight so you need to do it proactively that is that is that is the most important point now if you want to know how to like what kind of exercises to do how to do it, and so on and so on you can just just take my take my free course and that's it so it, it's 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 uh it's not a problem. What I'm actually going to be doing later is I'm going to create a group where I will be conducting the sessions and I'm going to be guiding, guiding people. Just have a guided session where, you know, first we do the meditation, then we do a contemplation, we we'll do another exercise and so on and so on and so on. So the most important thing to understand is that the your practice needs to be structured just like this. Meditation first, then insight, where you ask for insight proactively. And finally, Phase three, and finally, phase three or segment three, manifesting. Now that you know, for example, you okay, you sat down, you meditated for five minutes, then you received an insight. Aha! This is what I should be doing with my life next. So that becomes a goal, and now that that becomes a goal, now you 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 program that goal into your mind. You see, you're, you're working at this way, you're working with your full spectrum of consciousness. You relax in meditation, prime, priming yourself to receiving insights. Now you receive a brilliant insight and you're like, oh, wow, that's exactly what I should be doing. And you manifest that into being. Now you manifest that into being. How do you do that? There, there are so many manifesting exercises, visualization. Uh, even you can use contemplation to 
manifests something as well. All of these, all of these exercises, they're kind of they they're both they're both they they both kind of elicit information and they program the mind because they they always they they massage your mind and they kind of they they kind of groom your mind to uh, to believe in a brand new reality. You you're going away from this reality into a better reality. But you shouldn't you see. Uh, people tend to set set goals outside of such a process. They don't really. They just okay. I'm going to set a goal. For example, well, I'm going to okay. I'm going to earn this much by this date. Okay. But how about setting a goal that is really truly good for you? One of the things I I talk about in my book. Is that each of us should strive to become uh, a string that the universe wants to play? That is that is one of the things we 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 were born as these perfect strings. Imagine like you are a string in a violin or another instrument or a sitar. Now. The universe wants to play this most beautiful, amazing melody through you. It wants to play that melody, and and the problem is that the you're out of tune. You're out. Of, you're out of tune. You're either you're either too tight, or you're not tight enough, and you're not producing the right sound. And most of us are not playing the music. We're not tuned to play the music. That we were born to play in this life, just like, for example, if Mike Tyson were a chef at a restaurant instead of being a boxer, he would have been misplaced. That would have been a, a misplacement. That right? That would be a bit of a mishire. Pro, I would say Mike Tyson hiring Mike Tyson as a you know in, into a kitchen is you know it's probably you know not the best move. <laughs> you know, may not be the best move, but hiring as a as a boxer, yes, absolutely. Okay, this is gross exaggeration, but but look at look at you know eighty five percent of people on our planet don't like the don't like the work that they do. Now, I know that I know that you can say hey, you know what sometimes you just need to you know to uh, to feed your family and you just need to put in the work and just you know to to buy food and so on and so on. It's true. However, I I totally get it. I totally get it, but there's way too many people who who could be who could totally be doing something else, but they for for one reason or, or another they just keep they, they they keep doing something that they they either hate or they're they're not excited about it or or something else. They they don't love it. They know it's not their thing. They would rather. I have a friend. In New York, and he's a barber. He works at a barber shop. He he's usually late for work because he can't stand it. He can't stand it. And he and but you should see him. And he he, he usually he he lacks he lacks enthusiasm about his work. He's a, he's a decent he's a decent barber. But you should see him around seven p.m., like five minutes before seven, when it's time to go home. Oh my God! He turns into a machine. He's Tony Robbins. Those five minutes, he's Tony Robbins. That's it. He okay? He's 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 he's, he's stuffing his bag. Do everything is everything. He he becomes a high performer. That, that you you wouldn't see a high performer like that. Everything is done so perfectly, very quickly. This goes into the bag. This goes here. Okay, now that's it. Okay, let me get paid. Okay, and don't you know just okay and, and if if there's any obstacle on his way of getting out of that barbershop by 7 p.m., he would destroy that obstacle just like any one of the people that Napoleon Hill describes in his book that they destroy obstacles on their way to success, that he did he destroy, he would completely obliterate it. Now, if he applied that enthusiasm. To do something that he actually enjoyed, and he and you know what, the, you know what, you know what the 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 worst part about this is that he's he's a talented he's a talented man he's a talented man he he has he has a 
he has a talent for he, like he's 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 Middle Eastern, right? So he's a he's a talent for um for commerce. He really has an excellent talent for commerce. He he knows he knows how to talk to people. He knows he knows how to sell if he wants to sell something. And he's he has actually done that in the past. But somehow he steered himself into the, into a profession that he doesn't like. But anyway, anyway, so he is a string that is out of tune. The universe, the universe wants him to become this most amazing um, seller of goods and services. And and we need people like that. And there's uh, there's so many misplaced people in in the in you know in the in the sales profession. This, this, some people are in the sales profession. They they have not they, you know they 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 shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be selling for a living because you you don't want to buy anything from that person. He seems he you know he he occurs to you as as pushy or 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 arrogant or rude or whatever. These people shouldn't be selling things. Someone who it, it's an art. It's an art form. Hmm. If you so, so, yeah, so how do you how do you move on to the manifestation then? So are you, are you visualizing like your perfect day or what? Are visualization you doing? visualization is one of the techniques. Visualization is one of the techniques where you um you 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 visualize your desired outcome. Once you've realized how you move from insight to manifestation is that insight tells you what to visualize because it tells you what your goal should be according to your uh, to your talents and your strengths and so on and so on and so on. That, well, that's something you should be cultivating as well outside the outside this practice. But this, you see, the beauty of this practice that is that it brings everything together. It brings everything together. There. Are, let me okay. Let me finish about manif manifesting, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the practice itself. Uh, like in, in more more in general, in as a whole. Um, <clears throat> Visualization. Now you know exactly what you should be visualizing. You because you because you've received an insight what you should be doing with your with your life, what your next step next step should be, who your wife should be, who your friend should be, and so on and so on. You receive the most important insights for yourself, for your life, and for your business. Once you know, once you have an idea, aha, uh -huh, that's what I should be aiming at. You begin to manifest that into existence. You, you begin to shape that into reality. You do that through visualization. You visualize yourself performing that thing. Maybe you want to be a better speaker. So you visualize yourself being a better speaker and you, you're, you're an amazing speaker and you know and people give you, give you applause at the end and you visualize that and you get a feeling, oh my God. All of a sudden, th th this is what you do. I think that maybe your question stems... Uh, your, your, I think, I think your question really, I think what you're truly really asking me is how does reality come into existence as a result of this practice? Yeah, so well, maybe that's uh -huh. yeah, because like you, you do this every day, right? You did it every single yes. day. So every yes. day you came up with a problem and then you sat down and you contemplate the problem and then you. If you then, have one, yeah. If, if you have something one. is nagging you, if something is yeah. nagging you, it might. We, always, might come, we yeah. all have a problem, right? We all there's sure, always a problem. Sure. Yeah, there's always, there's a always something. So something to work on. Yeah. Yeah. There's always something. <laughs> so then, then you visualize you solving the problem, or are you getting the reward at the end of solving the problem, whatever it is, and then how your life would be like once the problem is resolved. You know how it changes yeah. your life, how it improves. So you're doing that, right? Every single day. Exactly. Because this is very, this is very similar to what we do in yoga. We do something like that in yoga. We call it a ritual. Right. And I can't remember the name of the ritual, but in yoga we turn everything into a ritual. Mm. So there's a there's a beginning, uh, there's a middle, there's an end, and a ritual has a certain flow to it. Do you know? Mm. And then the flow is in, and it's very similar to this. Like the first five ten minutes of the ritual, you're basically um becoming at one with god you're you're letting god know that you're going to work on this problem you're thanking god for the for the help in solving this problem and then you go through the ritual which which would be like you know you sit there and you go okay well what are the solutions to my problem you know like uh and then Absolutely. you and then you pick one and you go oh that's a great solution and then you imagine that solution and then you close it down at the end after you've desired outcome in that you thank god for um giving you that solution 
right. and, for, and for making it come true and things like that. And then you close the whole thing. So it's like a little... It's a, it's a structure. It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a structured yeah. approach. You don't just... Yeah. You you don't just start doing one asana after another and then uh, you get up and you leave. You no, know, you have there's a rhyme reason to it, right? It's yeah, a, like fine. what you're talking about is a structured approach. But but it, we have structure with the asanas as well. You know, we'll do certain asanas for certain things, other asanas yeah, yeah. for nothing. You know, so yeah, so it's a uh, um, well. But, well, you have mastery of that. You know, someone who has mastery of yoga can put together because because that person knows. Yeah. know how it works and what what is the best way to achieve the you know the ideal outcome and so on and so on so yeah. someone who's in a mastery can put together a structured approach for you Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's similar <laughs> to what you were talking about um in terms of dethroning the mind so in uh, in yoga they have levels and at first you make the mind stronger and you more as uh, you more define yourself with the mind Mm -hmm. And then, and then eventually, and then once you've completely like, become at one with your mind, then you start um, um, letting go of the mind, and then okay. you start moving away from the mind. And then eventually, on the top level, you end up in that no mind place where you completely let go of the mind. You completely let go of any goals. Oh, the Kundalini. Yeah, right? but, but to get there, you have to set goals you have to set desires right set right right terms. but at the but to let but to get to the top level right at the end you then yeah. have to let, let go, go of everything everything, everything. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense everything. that makes makes perfect and, sense right. and so the last bit is really <laughs> hard because up to that yeah. point you've been building 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 yeah. building and now you have to like almost demolish the entire building that you spent yeah. 10 years building you know um to get to the next level absolutely well, it reminds me of um, something I learned from Osho. You know, you meditation, even meditation, is is um, it's a tool. It's it's a tool. It's a tool. It's a crutch. Let's say you you're trying to cross a river. Okay, so you you need a boat. So you you, you get a boat. You you hire a boat. You get into the boat. You cross the river. And then you, after you've crossed the river, now imagine that you, uh, you take that boat and you just like, you put it, you know, you put it on your back and just carry it around with you. Well, there's no, there's no reason to carry around that boat. You, 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 you finished crossing the, you, you finished crossing the river. So you don't need that boat anymore. So the same thing with the, with the practice that you're describing, you need, you need that boat. You need that method to get to that shore. But when it's time to, to make the final step, you step off the boat instead of bringing the boat with you. Just you do the final. You you abandon the boat. You do the final step, and boom, you're on the next shore. You don't need the boat anymore. Yeah. So yeah. For, for me, um, the I learned the power of meditation uh, many years ago when I used to be married, and um, I used to have to deal with my mother-in-law and my uh, wife. And they used to trigger me constantly. Like, sure. they just have to, they just like my mother in law, she just had to be in the same building as me, and mm -hmm. it would trigger me. It would trigger wow. me, you know? Wow. She just oh, had to be. Vibration, it's just her vibration, absolutely. Just like everything about her triggered me and my ex wife. You know? <laughs> and the only way I managed to take control of the situation was learn to meditate. So, when, so, I, so the last couple of years mm -hmm. I was married to her. I was meditating two, three, four hours every day, you know, like, wow. like 20 minutes here, 10 minutes over there. Uh, I'm on the bus for 20 minutes. I'm meditating. I'm on the train for 50 minutes. I'm wow. meditating. So I would, my whole day would be, you know, I, you know, any, any time I got like 10 minutes or five minutes, I start meditating. Um, and, and I, felt, felt right? oh, massively, like it was, it was like night and day. It was like night and day. Yeah, that's right. I remembered my last big argument with my mother-in-law. I'd been med meditating for months, yeah, like literally like, like crazy. <laughs> yeah. And then we had this, and my wife was there. I remember my daughter was there. My mother-in-law was there. And uh, some big argument started. It just starts like anything, right? And I remember being totally detached, being totally unflustered. Not, not, right, right. Wow, Nothing, wow. like. Almost like we're talking about um, 
I don't know, we're talking about wisdom or something, you know? Like, yeah. We're having this massive argument, and the, my wife is going nuts, screaming and shouting. Uh, my daughter, who was probably about seven or eight at the time, she's pretending there's no argument going on because that's how she dealt with it. Okay. Um, and then my, my, my mother-in-law will be there, you know, fueling the fire, right? And I'm in this, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, to, be fair, to be honest, I wasn't actually even there because I was outside and I was observing the whole thing. Like, I was, I was playing the character in it. You know, I am, you know, one of the people arguing in this, in this fight. Right. But I was also watching this fight at the mm -hmm. same time. I was like, yeah, that's an interesting fight, you know? Yeah. You know? And, 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 and it, I found it fascinating. And it didn't trigger me at all. And, uh, and then I was like, why am I so calm? Normally, I'd be going berserk like the incredible Hulk. I was like, oh, yeah, it's because I've done all that meditation. Because you, know, you cultivated, I mean. because you cultivated the witness. Because you were yeah. the witness. That's you right. Were, yeah. you, you were not a participant, but but a witness. But then, like after about maybe an hour of or two hours of arguing, and I'm completely calm. I'm not flustered by it whatsoever. My mother-in-law, who is very calm and throughout the whole thing, she goes nuts. Like yeah, it, it pisses people off. It pisses a, per yeah. a person if, when a person is unconscious. A uh, person doesn't do meditation and stuff like that, you know. They were basically, you know, they're not they're not committed to a, a, a practice of you know becoming you know a bit more, you know, more present, more conscious. Yeah, but the, it, it triggers it, people like that. It, yeah, it pisses yeah. them off. And, and so she went <laughs> totally nuts, like 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 frothing at the mouth, like the whole works, like the wow. Hulk going nuts, right? Wow. wow. And I was watching her, and I had the biggest revelation of my life, right? I'm watching her going completely nuts at me. I'm completely calm, and then my my brain goes, "Oh my God, that's what I've been doing." As soon as wow. I saw her going no, up, I was like, "Wow, that's exactly what I've been doing for the last fucking ten years, right?" Right. And and it looked horrible, like it looked horrendous, like and and you could never take I could never take her seriously. And I was like, "No wonder nobody took me seriously because I was just going nuts, right?" And and it was like wow, and then it just changed my relationship with with getting angry. I was like, now it's like it just no longer got angry after that because I just didn't like what I saw. It's just like I was like, you can't even find it ridiculous and kind of find. Yeah, it. yeah, it was. It's completely ridiculous. Yeah. And that, and that's when I learned the power of meditation. That yeah. that prior to that, I would be a wind in the um, in the storm. You were uh, you were a slave to your system. mind. Yeah. You were yeah. a slave to yeah. your mind, and then what you turned the, you turned the tables on your mind, and all of a sudden now you used your mind to observe the situation. And and, and it was and it was effortless, you know, like completely effortless. It was like why? Would yeah, I, you know, like it was doesn't make any sense. And then I'd be like thinking when I was thinking, well, hang on a minute, why was I always getting angry by this? How right. is this? How is this even worth getting angry about? So, yeah. Well, one of the things that happens is that you disidentify from your ego. It's your ego that gets. Uh, angry. It's really the ego that gets triggered. Yeah, so that's, that's fine. Yeah. You can let the ego get triggered, but you are not your ego. So when you're witnessing it, then you you just not you just, you can just you can see what's happening. The Buddha has uh, a wonderful teaching about this. It's um, you. There are like three levels of um of uh, dealing with a difficult situation or with an urge which is also a kind of a difficult situation for example an urge to drink for example to drink or an urge you know to drink alcohol if you don't want to drink alcohol for example or to get angry if you don't want to get angry the the first level is uh the first level is noticing it after it has happened the a level zero is even when it has already happened, you you're not even noticing it. Even then, you're still angry, and you do, you don't you don't understand what's happening with you. You don't see it. You're you just you just remain angry, and that's it. You're completely in your ego. But that's level zero. That's nothing. Now, once you you're making progress, so at, at the first level, you notice you like the the event has happened. Someone triggered you. You got angry, and maybe you 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 responded in in a, in a not healthy way. And then maybe you yelled at them or whatever. But then you realize that, like, you know, minutes later or hours later, you're like, oh my God, I 
What was I thinking? What was I doing? So that's level one. Level two is um, is noticing it as it's happening. As it's happening. So someone is triggering you and you're like, oh my God, I'm getting triggered. And you see it. You're getting triggered and, and you, you're at this point, you already have the power to de-escalate. You have the power right there to, to stop yourself and say, okay, you know, I'm not. Because you see it. You see it. And finally, level three is you know it before it even happens. So it never it never happens because you you kill it in the cradle before it before it even has a chance to grow into into some unhealthy response. You're like, oh no no no, it's 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 try it's trying to come up for me, but I know I can see it for what it is. But thanks, but no thanks. Because you're already in the, in the present moment. You're already uh... yeah, exactly exactly. Yeah. And you if you're it. in the present moment, you'll see everything. Yeah, you know? that's right. That's right. Yes. Brilliant. Uh, okay. So that uh, and also you mentioned awakened entrepreneurship in your um, in your. Oh program. yeah, that's that's a big that's a big concept. That's a big concept. Awakened entrepreneurship. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a vast it kind of it's it's a vast concept, but it has the power to revolutionize any business, any business. Because, for, well, first of all, a business is an extension of the business owner. Really, is an extension. The most, what is the most important moving part of any business? Is the uh, the owner, yeah. Is the business owner? Is the mo the most important factor in any business is the business owner. If the business owner is a good leader, he has he makes healthy decisions. He's in touch with what's happening. Then, then the business at least, then the business has a chance. It's not a guarantee of success. But it has every, it has all the prerequisites. But but if not, then you don't have a, even the prerequisites. Then you, you don't you don't have a chance. Um, a business owner who has this practice, let's say for example, has such a daily practice, has a tremendous edge over a business owner who doesn't. Now, recently, something that that came out is um, generative AI. That's something else that is also necessary. That's also it's really necessary to take that into account. Something interesting, something is interesting I want to mention with regards to this practice and to generative AI. See, when you're seeking, when you're looking for insights, when you're seeking insights for your business, for example, you're a business owner, you want to find out, okay, what's my next business move? Or there's so many business questions, right? How do I make myself more competitive? How do I make my how do I make my business process? How do I how do I make my business process more efficient or smoother? How do I streamline my business process? Because you see, every every part of your business process that you streamline, it drops right to your bottom line. It because it's it, it necessarily saves you money. And there's no question about it. Because if something takes less time to do it. Or if two people can do what uh, formerly three pe people were doing, for example, I'm not saying that you know you necessarily you know you, your aim at like cutting down your your workforce. That's not necessarily the case. What I'm saying is, you you, you kind of use like a Occam razor, Occam's razor, and streamline streamline your process. Okay, if you have fewer moving parts, if, the, if there's a moving part that is not not needed in your business process. Maybe eliminate or whatever, whatever, whatever the things that need to be done in the business. As you streamline, as you make things smoother, and these could be many, many different things. One of them is hiring a better person, just hiring a better person. I keep coming back to Mike Tyson. Don't don't hire Mike Tyson to be a chef. Hire Mike Tyson to be a boxer. If you're if you're if you're a, I remember, I don't remember his name, but if you are a manager in boxing, you know you want you want Mike Tyson. If you are um, whatever his name is, I I forget. But you know, if you're a chef, hire a chef, and hire a talented one. Hire hire someone who loves what he's doing. If you if you can find someone who loves what he's doing or she's doing, and hire them, that's a huge asset to your business. That's a huge asset because every one of these steps streamlines your business process. And as you do that, what happens is you have your, your overhead diminishes. Your overhead and the overhead not only in money, your overhead in money, 
diminishes, meaning you 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 spend less. You start spending less because you you get you get rid of expenses. It, expenses some of the expenses just simply begin to kind of fall fall, fall away. It, 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 I, I've I've worked. I'm going to give you an example just now that uh, an example of a of a of a business decision that really really had to be made and was like years and uh, you know overdue. I was working with a client like that, but but you see what what happens is if you the, the more you do that, the more you do those things, the more you streamline your business. The, the more you you receive those insights. Uh -huh. What you, what else what else could I do in my business to streamline my business process? Even if you one of the things you need to do is to realize that you should be streamlining your business process because your business process is is part of your product or service. Even when even when people don't see what's going on behind the scenes, it's what's behind the scenes that what really matters. Now, the the better that works, the more your the more your overhead drops. It, it, it is one of the ways. I'm I'm just talking about money for a second for for a second. Now, now if that happens, if that happens, as that happens, as you really really paying attention to your business and you're really being contemplative about it. And you you meditate, and you're being contemplative about it, and you make the right decisions, and you're being strong about it. If you are able to diminish your expenses, what does that do? That drops to that drops right to your bottom line. And what happens to the price of your product? Now you're able to sell at less than your competitor. You see, now you're able to sell for less than your competitor. You become more competitive. Hmm. You become more competitive. It just it's everything all these things they they kind of work together but you need to be improving every part of your business just streamlining every part of your business don't be lazy about it really 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 work on your business to uh -huh, to see what where you can improve 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 and in the end your your if your competitor is not doing that the, you'll put them you'll put them out of business it, it should not necessarily be your goal to put them out of business yeah. but you you mentioned uh, earlier in our conversation. You mentioned Jim Rohn, and Jim Rohn has a wonderful saying. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I I uh, well, if he says, well, I if you if you are so good at selling, you talk to you talk to ten, and get three, and I talk to ten and get one. Well, you you talk to ten and get three. I, I talk to one hundred and get ten. And I yeah, did that's right. Yeah, I, get that. I heard that even this morning. Remember? Yeah, well, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. that's the way he taught, right? That's the way yeah. he used to teach. And he said, "I do that for I do that for a reason. Uh, that I uh, I do that for uh, for one good reason that I wish to win, that I wish for myself to win. But I do that for another good reason. I wish for you to lose. And 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 and, and that's because and it's not and it's benevolent because you 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 learn more by losing than you do by winning." Yeah, he was, he was an amazing man. <laughs> I, 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 many years ago, I met this guy who ran a um, cleaning, uh, you know, domestic cleaning business. <clears throat> and he started it because I think it was either his mother or his aunt were obsessive cleaners. You yeah. know, like they just had to clean. They just had to clean. Okay, okay. So, and I think it was his mum that used to just oh, clean that's all perfect. the time. That's so perfect. And so he was like, wow, you know, I could put that to mm. put that to use and make money from that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So he started a cleaning business. And then, because he he knew his mum was you know obsessive compulsive, right, right, right. Cleaning, he through her he managed to hire everybody in the business uh -huh. obsessive cleaners. So all the cleaners, right. so he he let her do the hiring. Yeah, so you see, all of the cleaners he had had that condition that they wow. had to clean. Wow, wow, wow! wow. So just, he didn't have to motivate them. He didn't have to do anything. Just That's awakening entrepreneurship the right there. Yeah, it's like. Home, yeah. Point them at the house, and they would just obsessively like they would perfect. And they, he he had to do nothing because they couldn't not clean it. Do you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, that's so perfect. That's that's so good. You know, like, but that's like, exactly how. That's exactly the way to hire. That's exactly how to do business. That's awakened entrepreneurship. It's also so. It's you know, it's the concept of Wu Wei. You know, like effortless effort. Mm, yeah. You know, like, like, yeah, without, without, yeah, doing, making things happen without exact effort.
yeah, swim in the direction the river is flowing. You don't, you know, ride in the direction in which the horse is already running. Yes. All right. So, so that's good. So that, yeah. that brings us to the end of this podcast, right?